Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on talking about poverty, lessons learned, and the way forward. I'm Husna Mortuza, Associate Director of Public Engagement at the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, and I will be your chair for today's session. I just want to start by saying thank you for people attending this session. I know we all have very busy lives, so I really appreciate that so many of you are making time to attend this learning session. And right now we have almost 250 people who've come to listen to us and our reflections on this. So that's been absolutely brilliant. Uh, you'll be spending the next hour with us. So please do get comfortable um, as we'll be going through our research findings. As some of you know, talking about poverty was a JRF and Frameworks partnership project. It was quite an innovative project back in 2016 when we looked at public attitudes on that poverty and how we can shift some of those narratives. Framework helped us to co-design the program and we worked with a number of delivery partners, some of whom are here, including on road media. Last year, we commissioned an evaluation piece to help us identify what worked well, less well and areas for improvement. Our aim for this lessons learned document is to be open, to be honest, and to be truly reflective of a new piece of work. And I hope in today's session, we can all embody that. I'm therefore delighted to introduce the panel today. And I know you've got the uh, bio, but I just thought I'd reintroduce them again. Firstly, we're joined by Patrick Regan, who is the Director of Rights Evaluation Studies and who has been leading this research. Patrick is a monitoring evaluation and impact assessment lead who specializes in human rights. So it's brought that aspect into this area of research, which we think is very exciting and quite creative. Secondly, we have Kate Stanley, who is Executive Director of Framework UK, which is the sister organization of Frameworks Institute in the USA, an organization that conducts um, in-depth research into public understanding of social issues, and most recently has worked with us and the nationwide and our partnership program around talking about homes, the foundation for a decent life. Both of those documents can be found on our website. I'd also like to introduce Natalie McDermott, who's the founder and CEO of On Road Media, an organization that brings people and media together to ensure better comms for effective uh, change of culture, but also to inspire the media and the system to have better coverage of social issues today. Finally, we have Fran Brennett. Fran is an Associate Fellow at the Department of Social Policy and Intervention at Oxford University. She has written extensively around poverty and policy issues, including framing uh, in, in the poverty discussion in the UK. We actually look, uh, speaking to Fran at the moment for updating a paper on framing, which we will later publish on our website at the next month. So please do look out for that. So this is quite a diverse panel of people with experience, with expertise, but also people who have been able to give us a more reflective and nuanced understanding of how well we've worked in this area. I should also acknowledge at this stage that we don't have people with direct experience on poverty on the panel. As you will see from some of the research, uh, framing is a deeply personal experience. And one of the things we wanted to do is make sure we have the diversity of views and we didn't think uh, for this short session we were able to do that adequately. But as a lessons learned document, we see this as the first program of many where we disseminate our learning to the wider public, to the sector that we work with and organisations leading this area of work. And we do have our on-road media organisation that works directly with groups of people. So in terms of format for the day, Patrick will talk through the key points of his research for about 15 minutes. I should warn you, it was a very big research, so there's lots of rich data coming out of it, but Patrick will, and Sophie, whose colleague will synthesize the main points. Uh, you will also have an opportunity to look at the report uh, when we send it to you after this session. I will then chair a panel discussion with the colleagues here for about 20 minutes. And then from 1.45 onwards, we will actually take cute questions from the audience. So please do use the chat function if you have any questions to ask us. So without further delay, I'll hand over to Patrick to present his key findings from the report. Thank you so much, Hosna, and, and thanks to JRF as well for giving us the chance to, to share our findings from this research. It's been a really interesting project and, and we've been glad to be part of it. Um, as, as Hosna mentioned, me and my colleague Sophie will be sharing some of the, the main headlines with you that came through our research, but there's a lot more 
in the report. So once it's published, I do encourage you to, to dig a bit deeper and, and read the findings and read the full report. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to just uh, start by explaining our research objective. Um, so we were tasked with identifying lessons learned from the TAP program to really understand what worked, what didn't, uh, to identify learnings for the future for, for similar programs and similar framing projects. So I really want to stress it wasn't a full impact assessment. Um, although we tried to scratch the surface a little bit on, on impact, um, we had a limited time for, for the, the research and uh, some limited data available to us. So our focus was really on listening, reflecting, and, and sort of learning based on some of the data that we collected through our research. Next slide. Um, in terms of our methodology, uh, we used a mixed methods approach um, because of the breadth of the uh, research questions that we wanted to answer, and also the complexity of, of understanding impact and outcomes for, for framing and narrative change uh, projects. So we wanted to have multiple sources to help us understand and help verify our, our understanding. We engaged a group of co-designers who identified as having lived experience of poverty to feed into every stage of the, the evaluation from the design to the analysis to the reporting. Um, we did desk research, focus groups and interviews with uh, people who participated in the TAP project, uh, partners, uh, staff at JRF. We also analyzed data from Factiva, which is an online and print media sort of database. Um, and also Hansard, which is a database of House of Commons parliamentary debates. Next slide. I'm now going to pass over to my colleague Sophie, who's going to share some of the first few uh, findings. Hi, um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Sophie. I'm a researcher at uh, Rights Evaluation Studio. Um, I'm just going to take us through some of our key findings from the Talking About Poverty evaluation. Um, this has been organized into sections. The first shows our findings regarding people with lived experience of poverty. Um, the second looks into JRF perspectives um, of talking about poverty, um, including project management and engagement and impact. And finally, we'll look at um, our findings uh, on engagement and impact um, in the third sector and in the media and political content findings. Next slide, please. So here you can see um, some of our main positive uh, findings regarding engagement and impact um, for people with lived experience of, of poverty. Um, firstly, uh, people with lived experience reported to have gained new skills from the project, such as confidence and communication skills, and most reported their involvement in the in the project um, having been a positive experience. Some people with lived experience also reported they had more interest and awareness of social narratives of poverty more generally, such as harmful cultural models of poverty in the media. Um, people with lived experience also reported the workshops and events, um, had strong participation from people with lived experience, they felt their needs were centered, and overall, people with lived experience found that talking about poverty related events to be accessible for people with disabilities. Um, and lastly, people with lived experience found the framing particularly effective and useful for them when speaking to politicians and the media. Um, one example um, of this is a participant stated they'd use the framing in a letter to their MP. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so concerning people with lived experience of, of poverty, um, our findings also raised some questions and some areas for possible improvement. Um, a question that became apparent through our research um, was how useful the framing content and tools were for people with lived experience when speaking to other people with lived experience of poverty, um, with some stating they wouldn't use the framing with other people with lived experience of poverty who already knew or experienced poverty in their lives. Um, another area that repeatedly came up was how to balance um, personal experience and, on, and authenticity with consistency of a frame message. Um, for example, some people lived experience reported the framing language was sometimes too restrictive and more options um, would have given them more choice. Um, 
And finally, looking at kind of areas for possible improvement, um, people with lived experience reported the need uh, for involvement um, from people with lived experience from the beginnings of the project and the design and research phases. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, making the project more accessible for people with disabilities and more inclusive for intersectional identities uh, within that group. Um, a couple of participants stated there could have been more consideration about the location of in-person workshops for those with physical disabilities, as an example. Um, and lastly, just looking at kind of outcomes and impacts. Um, some people with lived experience stated that they'd seen examples of framing in the media, um, and they believe the project to be achieving positive outcomes and results in the media, and also noting uh, they'd seen an attitude change in how the media was speaking about poverty. Um, and lastly, on um, impact, and it's important to stress this is perception only and no evidence was actually given, but some people with lived experience stated they felt hopeful that the project would have an accumulative effect, um, that this was connected to whether the project would continue and, and for how long. Uh, next slide, please. So now looking at um, kind of internal perspectives of the Talking About Poverty project. Um, one of the main findings was that staff felt the evidence-based research informed their strategic communications and that this was an asset for the program, um, making it more persuasive. Um, where staff felt JRF, where staff at JRF felt confident, excuse me, they also felt um, they had more successful and more effective conversations with different stakeholders. Um, one example um, was a participant stating it gave everybody a powerful way to communicate. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so looking a little bit more at um, kind of internal project management and impact, um, one thing we noticed was that the good practices seem to overlap with some of the main challenges. Um, so first was looking at, again, that balance between consistency and, and, and flexibility and authenticity. Um, the framing tools were said to be consistent, easy and quick to use, um, but the framing communication strategy was sometimes described as inflexible. Um, for example, an overemphasis on framing metaphors, restricted language, um, with some participants noting a polarization within JRF as a result. Um, second, the rollout was uh, noted as being passionate and intense. Um, the framing was used throughout the organization and was part of the JRF culture for a given time, but there was a lack of clarity about who the target stakeholders were um, and how to apply framing to different audiences. Um, so this raised some questions around relevance and appropriateness, um, depending on who the staff were communicating with. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and now just to look at internal, uh, external engagement and impact for the third sector. Um, so many third sector partners and allies valued and utilized the framing in their work. Um, many credited the framing with adding more dignity, positivity and effectiveness to their communications, um, stressing its relevance to their work. Um, engagement in the framing was praised. One participant described that there was a buzz in the third sector, um, which was credited with helping to movement build and, and leading to a more coordinated third sector. Um, one of the main examples that came through of, of framing being taken up in the third sector was the Keep the Lifeline campaign. Um, for those of you that don't know, this campaign was reported to have seen hundreds of, of charities and other organizations engaged um, using the framing metaphor of lifeline in relation to universal credit and working tax credit. Um, and although it didn't achieve the £20 uplift it campaigned for, um, as a temporary measure, the government extended the uplift for six months. Um, some suggested that the Keep the Lifeline campaign worked well, um, as it was about a single issue with a strong message and was time limited, um, rather than kind of attempt to rewire perceptions of poverty. Uh, I'm just going to pass over back to my colleague, Patrick. Thank you, Sophie. And uh, next slide, please, as well. So we're going to start uh, talking about some of the quantitative data that we collected. Um, and I wish we had more time to go through some of the House of Commons uh, data that we collected because there's lots of interesting things in there. But I pulled out this one chart because I think it illustrates an interesting uh, point. Um, so we searched the House of Commons database um, of debates um, and looked at the percentage of conversations around poverty, which also contained keywords from 
uh, some of the words from the, the framing toolkit. We found that uh, terms such as poverty and grip, poverty and locked, um, which are sort of two of uh, the framing keywords, had an increase in mentions in the House of Commons uh, when discussing poverty, uh, which coincided with the timing of the TAP program. But I think the, the Lifeline campaign example shows it best. Um, so here we can see the percentage of mentions in the House of Commons using the word Lifeline alongside the word poverty. And you can see there's quite a dramatic increase uh, during the campaign period. Our analysis also found that these peaks correlated with an increase in mentions of uh, JRF, uh, giving us an indication that, you know, JRF in the TAP program can take some credit at least for, for this uplift um, because there was a, quite a strong correlation between the increase in mentions of poverty in JRF, increase in mentions of poverty in Lifeline, um, and some of these other terms at the same time. I also just want to add that whilst uh, using keywords is, is uh, quite useful and, and uh, can be a good indicator, it is limiting in terms of understanding the full reach of, of framing, as framing is about so much more than just specific words, um, but this is what was possible within our, our, our research. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this slide is uh, it's the sort of same methodology, but applied to the sort of media database that we were using. Um, so again, here we're looking at the percentage of conversation um, around poverty, which contains some, some of the uh, TAP keywords. We can see the word lifeline increasing during uh, the lifeline campaign period again, um, alongside mentions of JRF. Uh, we can also see words like afloat, uh, which is the light pink line, and trapped, um, which is the black line, uh, following similar trend lines to JRF mentions, again, suggesting that that increase in, in proportion of those words being used um, had something to do with JRF and the TAP program. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the qualitative research that we did also identified some interesting questions um, around external engagement um, and some of the challenges that the program faced. Um, I think importantly, some people reported that there wasn't enough consistency um, of buy-in into framing um, and, and people were really quite divided on, on the concept, uh, which made it quite difficult to sustain in different organizations with JRF as, as well as others. Um, some people really championed it and some people were, you know, less, less invested and, and less keen to, to roll it out. Um, people felt quite restricted by the language, as my colleague Sophie mentioned, the metaphors. Um, and even if they felt convinced themselves of the value of framing, they found it hard to convince others in their organizations to, to be able to use the framing and, and convince others. Um, so it just made it hard to sustain that work um, at the organization level. Um, we also identified a sort of a lack of clear uh, planning and, and long-term strategy for the TAP program, um, particularly in terms of sort of learning, evaluation, and sort of sustainability. Um, there was very little documented on sort of actual plans and, and strategy of how to implement it, and I think that made it vulnerable when there were staff changes, when there was changes in the external environment of, of how that program would carry on and how it would adapt. Um, so I think there's some lessons there of, of sort of to document those things and having a really clear vision um, of, of how, how this work is going to be rolled out and, and sustained. Um, so what's the way, the way forward? Um, next slide, please. Um, from our perspective, we think it's key for, for JRF to decide how best to embed some of the learnings from this project and, and decide on what their role is in relation to the rest of the sector going forward. How will they work with the sector to implement uh, you know, similar framing work or, or other types of narrative change work in a sustained and strategic way, if it's something that they're going to keep using. Um, and whether it's for JRF or others, we pulled out um, a few key recommendations that we're uh, going to share now, and I'll pass back over to Sophie uh, to talk through those. Yeah, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so some of the key recommendations that we pulled out. Um, for JRF going forward. Um, the first are our recommendations connected to collaboration. Um, just to save on time, in short, um, from the bullet points that you can see, we would recommend that JRF involve people with lived experience and other partners and allies from the beginning of the project cycle, um, as well as consider their own role in relation to others in how they collaborate. Um, similarly, JRF um, 
could create a community of practice or champions across the sector. Um, and uh, we also recommend they continue involving and listening to the wider sector in their planning. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here are our recommendations in relation to management and risk. Again, I'll try to keep it short. Um, so we'd recommend that GRF plan out their monitoring evaluation um, a bit better and, and conduct a risk assessment from the very beginning um, and to ensure there's a clear project strategy and a theory of change. Um, we'd also recommend um, that GRF prioritize flexible framing um, and ensure modules like Flex the Frames are part of the core package. Um, and also to cultivate a culture of friendly critique um, and being more open to questioning and debate. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and finally, we have some key recommendations around engagement. So in particular, ensuring there's a clear plan and strategy around intersectionality and poverty um, to foster more diverse engagements. Um, and lastly, uh, that JRF would continue to center the needs and engagement of people with lived experience of poverty, um, which includes access and engagement for those with physical and or mental health conditions or disabilities. Um, that's all from me. I'm going to pass back over to my colleague, Patrick. Thank you very much. So that's all from us, actually. Um, yeah, so thank you for, for listening. Um, and I'll pass back over to, to Husna for the panel discussion. And I'm curious to hear what the rest of the panel had to say about this and then hear everyone's ideas for, for the future. Um, so back over to you, Husna. Thanks a lot, Patrick and Sophie. Um, it's really helpful to see this synthesized so well. The report is a lot more detailed and it goes, uh, talks a bit more about methodology as well. So it's really worth reading the report and digesting it. Um, in terms of the questions that you asked and how are we going to embed the learning? Um, and what next for us. I think actually what this project has shown that it's it's big, it's complex. And after five years, we've started to move some of those conversations on. Internally, we look at project management and monitoring evaluation. We also now have learning partners for all our programs. And we know that's something that we need to do because actually part of doing things that are new or different is, learn, is capturing some of those data earlier on, which will be really helpful. The thing that stood out most for me, a couple of things stood out most for me, but one of the things that stood out for me is actually how do we work more collaboratively with the sector, people who are closer to narrative change work. And what we'd like to do this summer is to work with some of the panel members here and those within the narrative uh, field to think through how do we take this program forward from the very beginning. So one of your uh, challenges to us is actually making sure that people from the very beginning who are doing this are involved. So that's something we'd like to do is to work with those organisations to think through what does TAP2 look like. We've also adapted a lot of that learning from for our talking about housing programmes. So I think what this has given us is a basis to think through, well, are we actually being inclusive in the way we work with people? Are we being strategic with our key partners? And more importantly, probably is what are the core messages? I was quite struck by the conversation around authenticity uh, versus consistency and actually should there always be a conflict? And some of that discussion, I think, is around where is framing in, in this space? It was quite new. Uh, we understand it better, but actually how do we have good communication to ensure greater advocacy and mobilization? So I think that for me is a really important piece of work that we can uh, host, facilitate with those in, in the sector. The area I think that's really challenging and actually would be really helpful to hear from the colleagues here is this is such a uh, cultural piece, is how do you do monitoring evaluation over a long period of time? And I think for the first time, what you have done in this research has given us some baseline data, especially around the media and social listening tools is something that we didn't really look at from the beginning. But I think in terms of share of voices and how things get moved, it, it's not linear. We know there's other actors in the market. We know what politicians say and how the media present issues. So I'd be quite interested to hear about how that, how we can do that in a different way um, with those already in the field. Um, so that's my reflection. I just wanted to ask you, Patrick and Sophie, what surprised you most about this research, if anything? That's an interesting question. Um, I think for, for me, what surprised me most was 
how polarized uh, it was. Um, we we did you know different interviews, different focus groups, um, and people absolutely loved it. Were real champions, or they were really against it. Um, and I think it was interesting to dig a bit deeper into how that came about and and why um, why it was so polarizing. I think this this question of um, you know, feeling like they they didn't have a, a voice in in being able to sort of adapt the framing to their own 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 messages in the way they would want to communicate it based on their experience with different stakeholders that they wanted to communicate with. Um, yeah, and and feeling like they they weren't allowed to question um, the the framing, and I think I think that sort of pushed people further and further away rather than being able to have a a more open and friendly debate around, you know, when is this the best tool to use? How should we use it? How do we adapt it? So I think, I think that was what surprised me most that I wasn't expecting to to sort of uncover when we started the research. Can I come to Natalie? Natalie, um, she's there, just to say, ask you actually, are we still polarized over framing? Uh, um, and and do we need to do more to actually show what it actually is? Yeah, I find that really interesting too. The word that really popped out for me was how people with lived experience felt hopeful uh, using this stuff. And when done well, communication that works should feel great. And the reason why it should feel great is because we are making quite a, a wholesale shift away from how we've communicated in the past as campaigners, where campaigning is very much focused on creating awareness of an issue. And we often then tell individual stories of trauma and pain in order to kind of make that impact. And as we know, it makes an impact and it creates awareness, but it can leave us stuck in unhelpful places when it comes to our long-term understanding of the issue. Now, framing, strategic communications, whatever you want to call it, I think sometimes it can get a bad press because sometimes it's conveyed as you have to say these certain things in order to create impact. And actually, what we need to do is to really evolve the way that we share this information so that it feels that we're moving away from mining people's trauma in order to create impact and we are communicating in a way that works. And, and we, as an organization, we boil that down to three concepts. So forget about the word framing or strategic communications and think of these three things, finding common ground, widening the lens, right? Looking at the structural issues and show people how we solve it. And I think what the frameworks research does extremely well is it gives us a really good understanding of where the public is on these issues. And where we have made really good strides, and, we're, and this is the work that we need to continue, is we need to continue to evolve how we help people own it. So to use their own language, their own dialects, their own campaigns, and instead telling them, being prescriptive about what metaphors to use and what not to, the metaphors can help shape our understanding of where we need to leave people, but how we do this work is, is, is really exciting. And I think that's where we have made progress. And for this work, if it's, if it's working, it should feel really good and it should feel hopeful. So I think where we are from where we were before, I think we've mostly, we've sold the argument like this stuff can really work and we need to keep pushing to make it more and more accessible and so that people feel more ownership over it. Can Thank I add, you. That's can I add to that. Um, no, I think I think the point of hope is really interesting, and I and I know some of the people we had in our our co-designing panel and some of the people we interviewed, you know, that had lived experience of poverty, really described, you know, trying to speak to a politician before and it not even realizing how badly it went until they had learned about the framing, been trained up on it, and then used it and were able to navigate that conversation so much more. With their MP or or sort of with a in a media interview, and I think that made them feel so much more hopeful about being able to change things and being able to get their messages and and um, across more. Um, but they, you know, they the the balance was, you know, they they weren't going to use it to their friends and family or or other people. They 
you know, because it wasn't a natural way for them to, to speak. It was work to, to build those habits of remembering these different messages and remembering these different ways of, of framing their work. Um, and I think that's where some of the challenges came of, of was always needing to remember, okay, I need to just how, how I would naturally say this and remember these are the tools I should use, but when they use them and felt comfortable, it was effective for them or they felt it was effective at least. Thanks, Patrick. Can I bring Fran into this? Because Fran, you, you've got a view around uh, this, so it'd be really helpful to, to hear your view, whether we have sold the argument and it is about making it more accessible and it's about ownership and being authentic. I, I would agree with, with all that. I think that's, that's absolutely right. Um, I think one of the uh, surprising things about the research was that it didn't seem to me to center uh, the phrase, it's just not right which I had uh, heard quite a lot in the, um, in the framing uh, project. And I think it's just not right, actually goes back to the values issue that uh, framing is meant to foreground. So I think a lot of the um, organizations thought it was really helpful to, if you like, divert their attention from uh, either stories, as, as Natalie's talking about, uh, victim stories in a sense, uh, or uh, just plain facts, you know, we just have to get the statistics across about the numbers in poverty and then it'll work and it doesn't. Um, and uh, also that um, uh, myth busting doesn't necessarily work either. And I think all that is really, really helpful to get people away from that. I think what hasn't yet been cracked properly, perhaps, is how to get the values across and how much in that exercise you, as Ruth Lister would put it, uh, woo rather than lead the public. So do you take the lowest common denominator amongst the public and try to make that into something which is helpful? Or do you try to change that in the sense that deep narrative change would do it, I think, um, to make it go more in your direction? And I think part of the problem is that what the framing research um, did to begin with amongst the public, which was uh, frameworks, um, was find compassion and justice to build on. And compassion can be just pity the victim and not solidarity. And justice in the way that frameworks picked up on it amongst the public was more about equal opportunities and less about equal outcomes. So that there is work to be done, I think, on uh, finding the values that we can build on and then seeing how we can do that more. Um, and my personal view would be we wouldn't necessarily go down the road of some of the metaphors that were used in, uh, in the framing work, but we can, we can come on to that later. Brilliant. I think this seems like an opportunity to bring Kate in, actually, in terms of the framing research and how has that changed in terms of looking more deeply to values and can you give examples where we did woo rather than lead the public i think that the um the, the idea behind the research was to understand which values would connect with people effectively and boost support for change and crucially didn't backfire for anyone. So very often in what we tend to do in communications work is to focus on what's going to bring the people already closest to us more close or people who are just on the persuadable edges. Our research is really focused on how do we speak to broad swathes of people? How do we engage at scale and identifying the values that will help us to do that? Well, being really careful that we're not pushing anyone further away because that that way polarization lies. So I would I would stand by the 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 research in terms of the values that we identified in combination, and that was crucial: compassion with justice, do the right thing, um, as being effective at, at doing that job. But I'd just like to come back to what good framing, how we think about good framing, I guess. Um, which is essentially that it's scaffolding for communications. So it's about creating a kind of solid framework that's grounded in robust evidence. But that simply means repeating ideas that we can show in hearts and minds and avoiding ones that backfire. And we, but we can hang off 
all kinds of different messages from that scaffolding you know to Natalie and, and Fran's point and Patrick has raised this from the research as well about flexing those ideas and they're only ideas they're not messages you know flexing those ideas and using them in ways that feel authentic and appropriate to the moment and the person you're talking to and the situation you're in but using that same coherent set of ideas and repeating them and I think thinking about framework framing in that way as a kind of scaffolding for communications not a set of instructions in that way we can see its potential as a movement builder something that can help build movements um, and people can unify around and make their own and adapt as it as it feels right but I just while I've while I have got a second I just want to also just pay tribute to the people involved in this work um, you know there was some there was some inspirational leadership from from JRF to get this work off the ground and, and make it happen in the way that it did Abigail Scott Paul in particular I think was was inspirational in that sense and some of the creative and pioneering work that people with lived experience did as part of making this project come to life I just want to to credit as well as well as mentioning my own colleague Tamsin Hyatt and, and Nikki Hawkins who worked at, at Frameworks and now works with Natalie at On Road Media so I just want to give credit to those people who worked really hard over many years with many others because I think for me what ha this report is really valuable in lots of detailed ways but for me the big picture is that what mattered most comes out quite well you know, what matters most is that people with lived experience found it to be a positive experience that shifted uh, what they were able to do, um, that people in the sector um, found it hopeful um, in terms of their ability um, to change things. And for me, that's what, what really counts. So, um, yeah, thanks for, for getting this evaluation off the ground and making it happen. Thanks, Kate. And you're right. There's lots of people who came before us who were leading on this project with lots of data and inspirational people, and they do deserve the credit for this. I do want to come back to the issue about measurements, though, because that's one of the things I think this sector struggles with is this is quite long term and we were fortunate to do this for five years. But actually, what what would a good measurement look like or how would we do this um, be quite helpful to think through what are the key components and why hasn't it been done? I'll go to actually Fran on this. Um, I don't know that I have the answer for that uh, any more <laughs> any more than than you're saying, has now. And I thought it was really uh, interesting to um, read the uh, evaluation report about how you get hold of whether this has had an impact or not. And that was partly about counting words, if you like. Um, and and that uh, is discourse analysis is quite a um, uh, a used method in in social analysis in social policy work and that's kind of what what that does um, and um, and we have to do that in a way if we're talking about framing being partly about language um, but if you're talking about deep narrative change and the fact that you want that to lead to policy change then I think you have to start thinking in, in different ways. And you're talking about the relationship between people's uh, values being drawn on and possibly changed, going back to our previous conversation, um, and what that does in terms of policy on poverty. And that, again, I think is something that social policy analysis can actually help with. Um, I mean, there has been a, quite a lot of progress in recent years on how you work out the causation behind social policy changes and that would include some of the changes that would affect people in poverty which are not necessarily always in the poverty field <laughs> it might well be in something more general uh, in terms of social security or employment or the economy and so on just as is recognized in the in the framing um, project um, but but those kinds of ways that social policy analysis work to try and find causation, which of course is usually not monocausal, but actually several different causes, uh, might be useful to draw on in the, in the next stages of the project, I think. That's really helpful, Fran. Can I just bring Natalie into this? Because actually you're doing this in a slightly different way now from not just looking at poverty, but you're looking at issues. It'd be really helpful to hear from you in terms of 
why you've moved towards that and how effective is it? Um, so we are really interested in popular culture specifically and how to influence popular culture. And how to measure that is the million dollar question. It probably does cost a million dollars to kind of get going. <laughs> And I and I my background isn't in research, but it's something that I think uh, with Comic Relief's new pop change, you know, network and funders pooling their resources and time and interest in this. I think we you know, the proof of concept is there. We know that popular culture has an impact on public opinion on issues which can have an impact in like the sort of temperature of the water that we're swimming in, which can have an impact on how likely a policy is to you know, be changed in the first place and stick. Um, how do we as people involved in narrative change, you know, how do we show that what we're doing is having an influence, I think is something that we need to answer in the collective is something I think we need to knock our heads together on. Um, initiatives in the US, like the Norman Lear Center, I think are really interesting because they've been looking at, at specific, uh, you know, programs and looking at how they change people's opinions, you know, before and after watching uh, things. And they've done a lot more sort of in-depth thinking on that. So that's learcenter.org. I think we can learn from what's happening over there. But I do think it is it needs to be a collaborative effort at this point. Um, so where there are organizations working around changing the narratives around specific issues, how can we pool our resources to work in partnership with a university, for example, over the long term? Because as we know, this this work is not a sort of a five year effort, unfortunately. Um, it's a long term effort. And the work that we've done, you know, specifically working with people with lived experience to develop confidence skills to go in and have those that influence behind the scenes with pop culture creators um, is long term work as well. And I think we need to to take that long term view, which I'm, I'm heartened to see that JRF is is doing and when it comes to how we measure it i think we need to 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 uh do that collaboratively brilliant thank you we're getting a lot of questions so i was just going to go straight to that and actually one of the last questions i've got is we talked about culture we talk about freestanding conversations but can the panel reflect on whether we need to tie framing into what we're campaigning for so um it will land differently and be a bit more ambitious Natalie, do you want to take that? Framing for campaign purposes. Sorry, my connection went unstable there. Could you repeat the question, Hizna? Sorry. Sure. So one of the questions we've got is around uh, framing for campaigns purposes. So framing is not just about culture. It's not just about a freestanding what to say right and wrong. But how do we tie it with some of the campaigns uh, that changes that are taking place? So what I was saying earlier about done well when when we train organizations and, and we have seen a, a big rise in demand of organizations in the campaigning space coming to us wanting to do this well, wanting to work with people with lived experience as well, as well and, and do that better. This is very much a journey as well. I think that we're all on, you know, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. Um, and I think where you see the kind of light bulb moments in the training is when we realize that this, to, to communicate in this way, to use these concepts in this way, is a positive and hopeful way of working that takes the pressure off people with lived experience having to kind of go out and uh, tell the intimate details of kind of what happened in order to affect change. So I see, I don't see framing as a tool which you can use you know, when effective, this forget, forget the word framing, forget the, forget the, the, whatever we call it. Okay. This is communication that works because you, you can choose to, to put together a really effective campaign that creates awareness and empathy over an issue that makes people feel, you know, something and, and that's fine. But in order to create change, we need to understand how we're leaving people feeling. So for, for me, and we're, we're, we're looking in partnership with other umbrella organizations, you know, to work with campaigners more generally about this. For me, this is this is the way, this is the future of communication. And I think, and, and the, the appetite certainly from the sector shows 
that our sector is ready to embrace this. And we just need to keep developing and improving the ways we support the sector to own it and to feel agency over how they use these tools so that it's 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 not so prescriptive. It's it's very much something uh, that can be owned and that people can put their identity, their stamp on. Husna, can I come in? <laughs> can I just add to that as well? And so I'm going to go to uh, Kate first and then Fran, and I really want to go through a lot more questions. Um, I'm conscious we've just started to scratch uh, some of the surface on this area, but it would be really helpful if, if we can jump, move along this along quite. Um, I agree very much with what Natalie said. Most of the work that we do at Frameworks UK is working with campaigning organisations so that their campaign can embody the ideas that we know work to win hearts and minds in ways that don't polarize and don't backfire, but in ways that boost support for the changes they want to see. So that's very much what we're, what we're being asked to do now across health, homes, um, homelessness, um, huge range of different subjects. And campaigners are really taking that to heart, not because it's a kind of framing take it or leave it issue but it's about being engaged and interested in what's going to make a difference because business as usual is not getting us as far as we need to go so um yeah huge huge engagement from campaigners across huge swathes of, of different sectors Fran? yeah just quickly um i think the the move towards narrative change which in a sense could be seen as wider than framing if you like um, is, is an interesting one, but it has challenges. And I think the challenge it is, challenges it has, particularly in the campaigning area, is partly that if you're talking about narrative change being a whole kind of world view and collaborating with different organisations, then that's got two issues. I think one is you start sounding like a political party because <laughs> you've got solutions kind of for everything. And the other is that your organisations who are involved in that um, campaigning um, also need to retain their USP, if you like. They need to retain what makes them tick and the single issue campaigns that they uh, may be working on. And if you're moving towards collaborative work in narrative change, which is, if you like, wider and deeper, um, then I think that's got those challenges to it, which uh, can be worked on, of course, um, but but need to be need to be discussed. I think. Can I add one really? I was quick going to comment? say, Patrick, do you want to come into that? Yeah, I just just um, just reflecting on a few few points that people made, um, and I think uh, particularly sort of really connecting to the sort of the values aspect of of the framing and how useful that is. And I think one learning from from our research, or at least my reading, from some of the things that came through were some of the challenges and some of the restrictions people felt was where they overattached to the the metaphors and the, the specific words. Um, and I think the, whatever happens next for, for future training or future support for the sector so that they can really own it, they need to really feel equipped with the sort of the breadth of, of the, the values of the frames and, and the ways they can adapt it so that it can be effective and it can be rolled out for a campaign or for a longer term thing. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to add that. And also, we're getting questions in terms of what frames did you look at and are there ones that were more productive than others? And if so, why? Is that something that you and Sophie can answer? Um, I mean, it's, it's tricky to say. We, we uh, as we pulled out some on some of those slides, I think there were certain words that did have more traction than others in, you know, has comments or, or the media. And those are the ones we, we point out, lifeline, sort of trapped, um, afloat. Um, but there were some, some other words that we looked at, which, they didn't seem to follow that same trajectory or they sort of were constant. Um, and unfortunately, we, you know, didn't have the time to be able to diagnose why that was. Um, yeah. So there, I would say read the report, you'll be able to dig a bit deeper into see exactly like there's, there's many, many charts. You can see which ones sort of were picked up and which ones weren't. Thank you. Um, and I have a second question. It's about, uh, around framing and intersectionality, which you mentioned. Can you talk a bit more about that? Because sometimes it's considered to be quite divisive concept as well as a positive one. So can you just tell us a bit more about what you found in your research? Yeah, I think um, 
one one question that was raised a little bit through throughout our research, both by us and also by people we we spoke with, was how well the sort of having a common message and, and a common set of, of values can really work for a diverse group of, of people who might have very different experiences um, and they might have identity related characteristics which impact their experiences of poverty and impact the messages that they want to get across and, and impact the values that they want people to sort of share um, about their experience. So I think one question that came up a little bit was whether whether this this project or this iteration of the project took enough time to to think about that and think about what that might mean for for different communities and in, in different identities. Just to add to that, um, so one of the examples of this was around age um, and about how um, people children might be able to use the framing or, or teenagers. That was kind of one of the key questions that came up, um, and also communities um, that might not speak English. Um, so yeah, just looking at those kind of intersectional aspects, this came up during our research. Thanks. Kate, I just wanted to ask for you to uh, talk through some of the EDI stuff uh, that comes up when you're doing some of the frame research and whether that does resonate in terms of some conversations around intersectionality. Yeah, I mean, um, somebody asked earlier on, I think, about the, the original research and, and who it was with, and important just to say that it was conducted with a broadly representative um, sample of the population, um, which is what enables us, by doing it at scale as well, to say these are the frames that are most likely to work um, most often um, and to test those that don't. Back at the original research as well, worth saying that we did test some frames that really bombed. So, we, you know, you can very clearly see that that some things, um, even at the research stage, you can see are working much less well. Um, focusing your arguments, for example, around um, tackling poverty because it's good for the economy. Um, not not the way to go at all um but this i think evaluation then layers our knowledge because it says of those frames that test well in research in practice when the rubber hits the road and we do this for real what works what do people find most usable and useful and what happens then and i guess that's the next layer where diversity comes into the question like some things are going to work well for some people in some conversations and not so much. And that's why we need to harness this real world evidence and continue to develop that scaffolding of what works best when and for who um, so that we can consistently be improving our, our framing, our way of talking about poverty so that it, it it's effective um, and we're not getting backfire effects. So any ways in which we can do that, I think, is is really important, but gathering this evidence and pooling it also really important. I guess one of the challenges of that is that evidence can change. So after two, three years, so how do you keep it updated yeah. in a way that's still relevant, but yeah. not going to the whole, uh, as Fran says, you know, we're not here to sound like one political party. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing to bear in mind, it's both a good and a bad thing, <laughs> which is that mindsets are enduring. You know, the way we think about big social issues tends to endure over time. It's not like attitudes which may ebb and flow with the new cycle. Um, mindsets, ways of thinking, deep narratives take a long time to shift. So that means that um, our, our evidence about what's like to be effective holds for um, long stretches of time. But on the flip side, it means it's hard to shift right? Um, and the lesson I take from that is we have to keep at this. You know, one of the biggest messages from this work and, and others is this is a long haul um, effort. And if there's one thing that I would ask funders to think about is, is staying the course. You know, this requires long-term commitment um, and sticking with it and testing out different ways. Um, and that's, you know, really important. Thanks, Kate. And I was going to ask a similar question to Natalie in terms of, you know, this is about infrastructure support and what is it that funders can do, um, staying the course, but is there anything else that we can do uh, as a group of funders here? Um, apologies, my connection is dodgy, but it's, it's coming in and out. But I think I heard your question. Um, 
what Kate was saying, basically, the long term absolutely is 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 imperative. What we find organizations need is time and space and time to think through how they support people with lived experience to do this work as well, because that that is a that is a shift that's happening in the sector and it's clunky and it's messy. It's not pretty, but it's happening. Um, and I think they need more time and uh, resources to think that through, to do it justice, to do that work justice. Um, we do need more people with lived experience leading on this work. And as the research says, being there from the very outset as well and not as an afterthought. Um, so funders, I think, can, can really insist on that as a way of, of working. And funders can definitely support us with the m &E of this stuff. It's often something which is given to organizations, the responsibility is on us to show how this works. And obviously we do that as well as we can, but to really do this stuff justice and kind of show this working in practice, we do need some long-term hefty investment around the M&E side of things and support with time and space to collaborate with other organizations to, to, to think that through. Brilliant. I'm really sorry I haven't got to all the questions that are coming through, but we will try to cover them after the session. Um, before we leave this, I just wanted to ask uh, members on the panel, what's the one thing you're going to take away from me from this discussion? Start with Fran. <laughs> that wasn't what I was going to say. <laughs> Um, I think it's really important, I mean, just building on what Natalie said, I think it's really important the emphasis on people with lived experience of poverty in this whole discussion and in the evaluation report, which is which is great. Um, there are obviously some tensions there about who's the general public, who are people with lived experience of poverty, um, they, they ebb and flow, it's fluid. We're not just different groups. Um, so that's important, I think. Um, but also about people in, with lived experience of poverty, not just telling their stories, but actually being part of the analysis and actually being part of the solutions and us talking about not witnessing, but actually, um, as ATD Fourth World does, actually, a dialogue, uh, a debate, a merging of knowledge, um, which can uh, work better together than it does when we're all separate. Thanks, Kate. I think for me, the big takeaway is that, you know, thanks to some um, inspired work over at least a five year period, um, together we've been able to make a difference to how we talk about poverty and that's to the good. Um, and it might be hard to measure exactly what happened when <laughs> and who did what, but there's a general sense of a positive direction of travel here um, and a signal to, to keep going, make it better and make it better next time. <laughs> Natalie, did you answer this or? No, but I agree with what Kate said. So okay. I won't say I take up any more space. <laughs> I'm what just gonna, said. what she said. Uh, Patrick and Sophie, what are your big takeaways? Oh, one big takeaway from this. I, I would say, you know, takeaway slash emphasis on on a certain recommendation of just trying to involve as diverse as possible of a group of people with experience in the design phase in developing those messages to make sure that they can, you know, people really resonate with them and their messages that people want to use. Um, and I guess as well for for his uh, for JRF to be thinking strategically about the most added value for, for them as a funder. And I think some useful ideas around, you know, taking on the leadership of the m &E and impact assessment of this is one of those areas where it's, you know, there's definitely added value for someone like TRF to be leading that. Um, so thinking strategically about that. Thank you. Thank you for everyone on the panel and for everyone out there joining us today. I'm really sorry I couldn't get through to all those questions, but it just shows me this is a live debate. We are going to be doing a lot more thinking, especially looking forward to our program in how we take this forward as part of our movement effectiveness work. So I would just say this really is a start of lots of conversations that are taking place and we hope to come back to you uh, over the next couple of months. Thank you very much for joining us today. Bye. Thank you.